Good morning, and welcome to worship. I don't know if you've noticed, but it's, it's a wee bit nippy outside. Anyone else notice? Yeah. So, at least you're all somewhere warm. Welcome to worship. The announcements today are found in the blue inserts, as I say each week. Uh, please feel free to take your bulletins home with you so that you have prayers and scripture for the week ahead for your private devotions. But if you leave them behind to be recycled, take the blue sheets home. There are a couple of time-sensitive things to announce. The first is that tomorrow, being Martin Luther King Jr. Day, the office is closed, but in the evening tomorrow at 6 p.m., we have our Welcome Back event, and that event is for the whole congregation to come together to welcome back our snowbirds, and I'm going to talk now particularly to the folks joining us at home, hopefully also to welcome back some folks we might not have seen since COVID began. Um, I know that some of you are joining us at home and maybe saying to yourselves, I'll go back to St. Armand's Key Lutheran Church in person sometime. Maybe I just need a sign. Well, the Welcome Back event might be the sign you're looking for. A wonderful reason to come back and celebrate with all the folks, their whole family at St. Armand's Key Lutheran Church. Um, the event is free, the music and the food and the fellowship will be wonderful, but we do need an RSVP because we need to know how much food to get in. And so the worship bulletin insert will give you details of how to tell us you're coming. And at home, um, also online in Connections and on our church website, saklc.com, you'll find ways to let us know that you're coming. And it'd be wonderful to see you. It should be an excellent wonderful evening. Now, also be aware that Lutheran World Relief personal care kits need to be assembled and packaged. We'd like to keep our total at about 1,000, yes, 1,000 personal care kits that go off to Lutheran World Relief. They could end up going to South Florida. They could end up going to the Ukraine or all points in between. They go all around the world. Thank you to generous donors who financially made this possible. Now we need your hands to put those kits together and package them so they can be shipped off by Lutheran World Relief. Um, the kits will be put together on February the 3rd at 10 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall, and all the details are on page one of the announcements. On page two, another time-sensitive thing that must be announced is the Kids Against Hunger food packing events. We seem to be doing a lot of packing these days all in a good cause. This time it's putting together kits of food um, for kids. That's on page two on the left-hand page at the top of the column. Um, that will take place on February 11th from 12 to 2.30. But you can sample the food that will be in those packs if after worship, instead of leaving the building, you instead just go through to the fellowship hall. Um, some of our team will be there to allow you to sample the food that we're inviting you to come and help us pack to fight hunger amongst kids. The details are in the bulletin. There is a table in the narthex that tells you more, and the whole team from SACOC and Kids Against Hunger will be in the fellowship hall right after worship. After the dismissal, shake hands with me and then just go straight through to the fellowship hall. Michael, have we left anything out that really needs to be announced? Say again. Oh, the King's Brass. Hold on, where is that? Oh, it's down the second, the first column on page two. The King's Brass event is coming up on January 26th. Wonderful, wonderful night of music. You do need to buy tickets in advance. Uh, they're $25 in advance and $30 at the door. What a wonderful event. Lots of you came the last time you, they were here and you raved about it. And just amongst us, whenever we have a fellowship or a music event, that's a really, really easy way to invite your friends to come to church. It's, it's kind of awkward to invite friends to come to worship sometimes. You know, you feel like you're walking on eggshells. You shouldn't just invite them, but sometimes it's tough to do that. It's the easiest thing in the world to say to friends, hey, we're having a concert at church tomorrow. Come with us. We're having a concert in the garden. Come with us. We're having a fellowship event. Come, come have fun together with us. A wonderfully easy way to involve your family, friends, or neighbors in the life of the congregation. That's a little tip free of charge from your, from your pastor. Now, let's compose our hearts and our minds for worship.
Please stand. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, who makes all things new, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Trusting in God's mercy, let us confess our sin. Holy One, source of our renewal, we confess that we are wrapped up in sin and cannot free ourselves. We have not practiced your righteousness. Our hearts have turned away from you. For the sake of the world you so love, forgive us that we may be reconciled to one another for the glory of your holy name. Amen. Thus says our God, the former things have come to pass and new things I now declare. God's mercy makes us new. We are forgiven in the name of Christ, our Savior. Amen. Holy God, our strength and our Redeemer, by your Spirit hold us forever, that through your grace we may worship you and faithfully serve you, follow you, and joyfully find you, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading is taken from the 49th chapter of Isaiah. Listen to me, O coastlands. Pay attention, you peoples from far away. The Lord called me before I was born. While I was in my mother's womb, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my cause is with the Lord, and my, re my reward with my God. And now the Lord says, who formed me in the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the sight of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the survivors of Israel. I will give you as a light to the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and his Holy One, to one deeply despised, abhorred by the nations, the slave of rulers. Kings shall see and stand up, princes, and they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord, who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel, 
who has chosen you. The word of the Lord. Our second reading is from the first chapter of 1 Corinthians. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and our brother Sosthenes, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that has been given to you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will also strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful. By him you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel according to John. John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and declared, Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks ahead of me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but I came baptizing with water for this reason that he might be revealed to Israel. And John testified, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it remained upon him. I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I myself have seen 
and have testified that this is the Son of God. The next day, John was again standing with two of his disciples, and he watched Jesus walk by and exclaimed, Look, here is the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they remained with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated anointed. He brought Simon to Jesus, who looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John. You are to be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. You'll have noticed that our music is enriched this morning. Um, I want to introduce to you our own folks, our own house band um, from Saturday Night Worship, uh, Dave Morgan, uh, who is just a fantastic percussionist and has been his entire life, a rich life of music that he shares with us today, and Mark Danzinger, who is also a member of the congregation, gifted musician and composer and professor of music at New College. And so, along with Michael, they form our house band, the basis of our house band. It's Saturday evening, five o'clock worship, and it's wonderful to be able to introduce them to you in this new way, although their faces and their names are probably not new to you at all. But thank you guys for being here today. By the way, just before I begin the sermon, it's Kelly's birthday today. So, so be really nice to her after worship, will you? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. So, it may not be that everyone knows these lines from a favorite TV show because it was on quite a while ago, more years than I probably care to remind you. But if I said some of his lines, you'd probably figure out who it is. Uh, here's one of them. This is the city, Los Angeles, California. I work here. I'm a cop. Yeah? Recognize that? This is where I go to work. I carry a badge. Yeah. Now, if I told you his most favorite line, you know, you're going to know who it is. All we want are the facts, ma'am. Okay, Sergeant who? Joe Friday. Joe Friday. Thank you. Thank you for playing. Joe Friday. Uh, Ma'am, all we want are the facts. It got translated into a little shorter version where everyone's convinced he said, just the facts, ma'am. Well, if you want just the facts in Scripture, go to Mark's Gospel. Mark was the first gospel written. It's the shortest of the gospels. Matthew and Luke incorporated almost the entirety of Mark's gospel in their gospel versions. And, and Mark is known to be sort of pithy. Uh, the language, original language he writes in is is very much of the common folk. It's not particularly polished, and it's sharp, and it's sharp, and it's to the point. It just tells you what happened. And the reason it's short is it doesn't, he doesn't embellish anything. Matthew and Luke, they, they embellish. They added some material that was unique to them, and a whole bunch of, a big source of material that's now been lost, except where it pops up in Matthew and Luke. <sighs> But another old TV show, this one for kids, um, had a little thing that they would show, and then they would sing, one of these things is not like the other. Remember that? Well, in the Gospels, one of these things is not like the other, and the one that's not like the other is John's Gospel. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic Gospels, seen through a single eye, and John's is so different because John is the opposite of just the facts, ma'am. John compiles his gospel after the other three have been written and are in circulation. 
and John is determined not to plow the same ground. He wants to say not just what happened, and he carefully chooses the what, but he wants to tell you the why. Being the last gospel compiler allows you the time to reflect upon what the early church has wrestled with, prayed over, debated, discussed, handed down to this next generation that is to come. John wants to say the why and not just the what, which is why his gospel doesn't start with a birth narrative, neither does Mark. He's in too much of a hurry to tell you how Jesus was born. The only birth narratives we have are from Matthew and Luke, and in our lives and traditions and in our head and our heart, we combine the two into the Christmas story we know. John doesn't want to get anywhere near that. John isn't just telling you what, he's telling you why. So, John's gospel starts with a prologue. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Without Him, not one thing came into being, but all things came into being through Him. That's, that's so different, isn't it? such a contrast from, and the birth of Jesus took place in this way. No, John wants to ring out, squeeze out, delineate, teach, share all of the nuances of not just Jesus coming, but where He came from, what He did when He came to us, and why He did what He did. So, right from the get-go, John's gospel tells us that Jesus was the Word, the divine Logos, that existed before time. In the beginning, Jesus, the Word, was with God. And just in case you think that this was just some kind of proclamation, John tells us the Word was with God and the Word was God. That explains in a nutshell the sort of meandering language that John the Baptist uses in John the Evangelist's gospel. I was the one who came after him, but he was before me because he, you know, and by the end of it, you can't remember whose father it was and which end was up. It's a very convoluted sort of phrase, but it basically describes John the Evangelist's prologue. John the Baptist recognizes that Jesus may have come after him in birth order, but Jesus existed before him. Jesus existed before time. In the words of the Greek church, Jesus is both source and final purpose, the Alpha and the Omega. That explains John the Baptist's convoluted phraseology. And notice, too, that John the Evangelist doesn't want to tell all those John the Baptist stories that the other gospels tell. He wants to tell what John the Baptist revealed Jesus to be. And so, John the Baptist is standing in town, <laughs> minding his own business, and Jesus walks by, and John the Baptist makes a declaration. Now, incredibly famous words, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the whole world. They're very familiar words to you, not just because once every three years we encounter them in the lectionary cycle, but you can thank Pope Sergius I. You're welcome. Pope Sergius I reacted quite badly to the Council of Trullo in 692. That makes it a pretty early council. What, I hear you ask, did the Council of Trullo do in 692 that so annoyed Pope Sergius I? Well, I'm glad you asked. The Council of Trullo said that when you painted or wrote an icon that involved Jesus, you could only show Jesus as a man. You couldn't show Him as anything else. Specifically, you could not show Him as a lamb. Pope Sergius I reacted quite badly to that, and in a peak of liturgical 
passive aggressiveness, he proclaimed that the words of John the Baptist would be included in the liturgy of the Church of the West. Includes our church. And every celebration of the liturgy would include those words of John the Baptist. They were to be spoken or sung. And from the year 692 until this morning, they are in the liturgy of the church. The words of John the Baptist appear in the liturgy as the Angus Dei, the Lamb of God, Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, grant us peace. So if anyone ever tells you, we can just drop the Angus Day from the liturgy, you can say, no, it's been in there since 692, leave it alone. Pope Sergius wasn't just being passive aggressive, although he was that, but he understood the power of us acknowledging, confessing, believing, and incorporating into our faith life the understanding that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the whole world. And we don't know what kind of Lamb of God Jesus is. Is He the Passover Lamb? You'll remember from your days of confirmation class or Sunday school where the, Israel, the Hebrew slaves are held captive in Egypt, and Pharaoh will not let God's people go. And so, various plagues are imposed on Egypt. And the last is that the angel of death will visit the houses of Egypt and strike dead the firstborn of every house in Egypt. That's the final plague after which Pharaoh relents and lets the Hebrews go free into the wilderness on their way to the promised land, the land of milk and honey. But the people of Israel, the Hebrew slaves, will be spared this plague. How? By sacrificing an unblemished lamb. And then in addition to being told how to prepare and eat and dispose of the lamb, the Hebrew slaves are told to take the blood of the lamb and smear it on the doorposts and the lintel of your house. And when the angel of death visits Egypt, the angel of death will pass over the households of the Hebrews and spare their firstborn children, will pass over, hence the Jewish feast of Passover, where lambs are still slaughtered, prepared, eaten, and disposed of in accordance with the rules and regulations that were given to the Hebrew slaves. But notice, it is the blood of the lamb that frees the people. It's the blood of the lamb that allows them to be spared by the angel of death, and it's by the blood of the lamb that they are freed, as our liturgy puts it. By His blood, we are saved, we are freed. Could be. It could be that Jesus is the lamb that gets sacrificed in burnt offerings to God, where particularly a lamb, because they were expensive, much more expensive than doves and other sort of wildlife that you could kill and offer up as a sacrifice to God. But a lamb was prepared very carefully, and when you slaughtered a lamb and offered it up to God, your sins were forgiven. It reestablished that relationship between God and His people. Maybe that's the Lamb of God that Jesus is as He takes away the sins of the world. Or maybe Jesus is the Lamb of God that we see in the book of Revelation. That's a scary, confusing book, but the parts that describe the Lamb of God are astoundingly beautiful and powerful. This is the Lamb who was slain but is alive. This is the resurrected and ascended Jesus. This is the Lamb before whom all the world, all of creation, bows down in worship. Or maybe it's a sort of combination of all three, as, as one scholar sort of put it. Let me just quote this. Maybe Jesus as the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world is the very one through whom God enters the human story, offering redemption, an old symbol being, made, uh, being used in a new way. That could be Jesus in the book of Revelation very famously, profoundly, beautifully says, Behold, I make all things new. 
what we do know is that this Lamb will redeem us, will take away our sins, because we know that this is not just the Lamb from God, but the Lamb of God. And because of John's prologue, we know, we understand, how can He take away the sins of the world? Only God can. And then we understand that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. But that's only half of the gospel story today. The rest is about discipleship, because the other half of the text talks about John's version, John the Evangelist's version, of the calling of the first disciples. And this is a good clue to understanding the rest of John's gospel, because this all occurs astoundingly early in John's gospel. I know we don't often dwell upon the actual reference of the Scripture, but this is only chapter 1, verse 29. John's got a long gospel. We're only 29 verses into it at this point. But it's worth paying attention because a pattern is set here, and the pattern looks something like this. Jesus asks a question, and that question is met, one hopes, with a response, and then Jesus extends an invitation. And then, as the old saying goes, we're off to the races. And that's a pattern that starts here but gets repeated throughout this Gospel of John. Now, I'm often asked, I, I, I like your sermons, Pastor, but they're a little too cerebral, a little too in the head. How does it relate to our lives? Well, sometimes it's difficult to relate it to our lives because it intersects with different people's lives in different ways. So, for example, Jesus speaks to us, but I can't tell you what He's going to say to you, because there isn't just one message. Jesus has a relationship with you, remember? Famously at Christmas, I named some of you and said, yes, you, you. And what Jesus says to you is unique to you. I can't guess what it is. I can only respectfully suggest that you listen for what He's going to say. I say that because our lives are so filled with stuff. And some of that stuff includes noise and distraction. And we wonder why God doesn't speak to us. But God is speaking to us. Because God doesn't wait for us. God doesn't look down and say, oh, I think so-and-so is receptive now. I'll open up a channel of communication. God speaks to us all the time. Is speaking to you all the time. You need to tune in. And now I'm going to age myself as well as the rest of you, because pretty much everyone in this room will remember the days when to get a radio station, you had to dial into it, you know, turn the knob physically, and you went between stations, and there was sometimes a lot of noise and cackling between stations, and then suddenly you got a signal, and nine times out of ten you went too far and had to come back again, and you maybe had to do that a few times until you found the sweet spot, and the signal was coming in loud and clear. Come on, I'm not the only person that remembers that, huh? Good, you're with me. Well, there is a lot of static noise around our lives. And the only way to tune that out is to tune in to that which is important. And Jesus speaking to you is important. And I know that sounds pie in the sky because it may have been a long time since you heard Jesus speak to you. But I mentioned in a sermon once before, and I'll repeat it because it's a pretty good illustration, and I want to get my money's worth. It's a single-cell cartoon of, of sheep and some of them are sitting in the field watching TV, some have headphones on listening to music, and they're all in the foreground having a good time. And in the distance is a shepherd jumping up and down and waving his arms like that. And the caption is the words of the sheep. 
saying to each other, gosh, it's been a long time since we heard the voice of the shepherd. Yeah, because you're busy doing stuff. Because of all the noise that we're generating or allowing our lives to be embedded with. I, I don't want to make the the Word made flesh sounds so trivial, but in that cartoon, Jesus is the one in the distance frantically waving His arms and begging us to tune in and hear the words of the shepherd. So, at this point, I can't tell you what the words are, but I can tell you you can tune in to hear them. And that tuning in may take a multiplicity of forms, but I respectfully suggest to you part of that might be prayer. Part of that might be prayer where we say, speak to God and open our hearts to God, but then are silent enough, deeply enough, long enough, that when the response comes, we hear it. Even if it comes in God's time and not ours, and even if it comes with an answer we're not looking for. But God does speak to you in Christ Jesus. We have to hear it. And the second part of that is not just that Jesus speaks to us, but that a response is given. And I can't tell you what that response is to be. I can suggest the answer will probably be, yes, Lord. But that's for you to decide, depending on what Jesus asks of you. And that response may vary. It may not be a yes, Lord. It may be an I'm too old, Lord. Or this is Florida. Make it relate to Florida, Ken. It might be a, well, Lord, I did that up north. I'm not sure I want to do that again down here. Or it may be something less trivial than that and much more profound. It may be, Lord, I'm, my heart's breaking. I'm mourning and grieving so much. I can't bind up anyone else's broken heart. Or it may be the response of Moses. Yes, Lord, here I am. Use that person instead. That's what Moses said. Here I am, Lord. Use Aaron. Here I am, Lord. I hear you loud and clear. My brother's much better than I am at this stuff. But it worked out for Moses when he said, yes, Lord, speak. Your servant is listening. I don't know what your response will be, but I pray it will include the word yes. And then Jesus issues an invitation. Remember, we're in that trifold thing. Jesus speaks, people answer, and then Jesus extends an invitation. And I don't know what that invitation will be to you. I know what it's going to involve because I know what it always involves in John's gospel. It involves discipleship because that's what this is all about. Jesus asking a question, us responding, Jesus extending an invitation, it always involves discipleship in some way, shape, or form. It always involves becoming a servant of the servant of God. It always involves love and grace and care, forgiveness and mercy and reconciliation and kindness and respect and justice and life and light and joy. It just always does. I can't tell you what the invitation will be, but I can guarantee it's going to be a heck of a ride. I guarantee you, your life will never be the same again because it will never be your own again. And I can guarantee you it will involve a relationship with the one who is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the whole world. Amen.
please stand as together we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray that the light of Christ may shine upon the church, the world, and all people according to their need. Thank you, loving God, for Jesus. Thank you for making him our doorway into your heart. Thank you for making him your dear lamb, the sacrifice for our sin. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, cause your church to preach like John the Baptist. May it always point to Jesus and say, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Lord, in your mercy. Make disciples of everyone in this congregation. Help us to use our spiritual gifts to glorify you and build up our community of faith. Make us bold to tell others, We have found him of whom the scriptures speak. Lord, in your mercy. Tomorrow, we commemorate the life of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Thank you for his witness. Teach us to value one another because you have created all people in your image. By your Holy Spirit, make the content of our character reflect your will. Lord, in your mercy. Enlighten the minds and purify the hearts of those who take counsel for the nations. Turn them from the idols of power, prestige, and ideology, and teach them your ways. Heal the divisions that beset our country. Lord, in your mercy. Stoop down, O Lord, and hear the cry of all who are afflicted by suffering or sorrow, including Janice Angel, Lois Habib, Karen Creston, David Ross, Mary Ellen Shoup, Sue Strunk, Peter Tan, Ruth Veit, Greta, granddaughter of Bruce and Jackie Modal, the people of Ukraine, and those we name in our hearts. Lift them out of their desolation, make their footing sure, and put a new song into their mouths. Lord, in your mercy. Most gracious Father, thank you for those who have died to us but whose lives are safely in your hand. Sustain us with that same strong and merciful hand. Then make us fit to dwell with him in the glory he shares with you and the Holy Spirit forever. Lord, in your mercy. All these things and whatever else you see that we need, grant to us, dear Father, for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. The peace of Christ be with you always.
liberating God, you break the bonds of injustice and let the oppressed go free. Receive these offerings in thanksgiving for all your works of merciful power and shape us as your people of justice and freedom. You we magnify and adore through Jesus our Savior. Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy God, you alone are holy, you alone are God. The universe declares your praise beyond the stars, beneath the sea, within each cell, with every breath. Generations bless your faithfulness through the water, by night and day, across the wilderness, out of exile, into the future. We give you thanks for your dear Son at the heart of human life, near to those who suffer, beside the sinner, among the poor, with us now. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering his love for us, on the way, at the table, and to the end, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We pray for the gift of your Spirit in our gathering, within this meal, among your people throughout the world. Blessing, praise, and thanks to you, O holy God, through Christ Jesus, by your Spirit, in your church, without end. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold Him who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are called to His supper. All who love Jesus are invited to join us at His supper this day. Please be seated.
Please stand. Let us pray. Holy One, we thank You for the healing that springs forth abundantly from this table. Renew our strength to do justice, love kindness, and journey humbly with You. The God who faithfully brings forth justice and breaks the oppressor's rod, bless, strengthen, and uphold you today and always. Amen. Follow the way of Jesus.